So our next panel will be about people and purpose in entrepreneurship. And for this panel, I would like to call to the stage Christos Apostolopoulos, Janis Georgiakelos, Spiros Kouvelis, George Stengos, and the moderator, and that will be Marisa Antonopoulou. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, hello, we're just waiting for a couple of minutes so Mr. Kouvelis can join us uh, online. Um, I would like to welcome um, this panel. Uh, my name is Marisa Antonopoulou, and I will be moderating this panel. Um, ah, hi. Okay, so. <laughs> hello, everyone. Okay, so we're good to go. So, this panel is called People and Purpose in Entrepreneurship. Um, we're here with uh, four people from, who have a lot of experience in the purpose and entrepreneurship um, part. Two businesses, two big enterprises that um, have uh, are leaders in the sustainability um, aspect. Uh, a startup, which is showing us the way of how things should happen from the beginning in a business, and a person who has a lot of uh, experience and a lot of expertise. So, Mr. Christos Apostolopoulos is the Total Quality Manager at Friesland Campina Hellas. Welcome. Mr. Yanis Yirvakelos is the Communications and Corporate Affairs Director at Athenian Brewery. Uh, Mr. Spiros Kouvelis, uh, our ESG specialist, is the team leader of the EU and Gulf Cooperation Council on Climate Change and Energy, and is also the senior associate of the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. That's a, a long uh, title, which means that he's a lot, he has a lot to say on, on the subject. <laughs> and Mr. George Stengos, uh, is the founder and CEO of Cyclify, a startup that's, um, as I said before, leading the way in sustainability. Where I would like to start um, with, you can give us a small introduction uh, of yourselves and explain to us what um, your companies do as far as sustainability and purpose uh, is concerned. Um, maybe we can start with uh, Mr. Jörga Kielos. Uh, talk to us about Athenian Brewery. We know that you have uh, some very interesting projects as far as sustainability is concerned. I'm very excited to hear about them. Yes, I'm also very excited to be here. Uh, uh, Athenian Brewery, which is the operating company of Heineken in Greece, has been, I wouldn't say a supporter or a sponsor, has been part of Orange Grove since its beginning. And just to connect it with the title of this panel is also, apart from the purpose, also that some people in the company at the time believed in the purpose of this uh, initiative. So it is uh, very true that it all starts and ends with people, first of all. And uh, I have to say before going into that, that it's very fulfilling for someone that is many years in the company, in my company, like myself. I was not part in the initial Orange Grove setup, but I have seen it grow and develop, and it's very fulfilling to see an initiative that you have supported from its birth to thrive to continue to grow, to expand, and to have affected positively so, so many people. When it comes to the sustainability part, uh, I think it's obvious that now businesses in our times cannot uh, distinguish between business and sustainable growth. One doesn't exist without the other for uh, many reasons, ethical reasons, business and financial reasons, uh, governmental affairs reasons, it's inevitable that you take this uh, stance, but what is important underneath this is the actual purpose and how you embed the sustainability and responsibility, the ESG uh, concepts in the strategy of the company and uh, ourselves as Athenian Brewery and to have it uh, at a broader scale, Heineken has a very comprehensive strategy when it comes to sustainability and responsibility. We also have a name for it, we call it Brewing a Better World and we based it on three uh, major pillars. One of them is obviously the environment, where we talk about uh, mostly about CO2 emissions, about uh, water 
resources management and about circularity, issues that affect our operation throughout uh, Greece, but also at a wider scale globally, I would say. And there are specific commitments and plans behind those commitments are very concrete and are indisputable when it comes to leading the way forward. The second pillar of this uh, strategy has to do with our social responsibility, starting from our employees and how we treat them having their uh, health and safety as our number one and again undisputed priority, but also when it comes to eliminating all inequalities at the workplace and uh, making sure that every person is properly uh, rewarded for uh, what he does or she does. Again, under the social pillar, obviously it is inclusion and diversity as part of our strategy and as uh, an industry, and maybe we could talk about this later, that is mostly not so, uh, I would say, gender balanced. It's a masculine industry beer uh, for historical reasons which all of us found, but it's a, it's a uh, it's a true cause for the company and a true ambition to make uh, gender balance a reality, even in the masculine-oriented beer business. Uh, and uh, last but not least, our effect uh, and uh, impact, positive impact in local communities, in the ones that we operate and in the ones that we collaborate with. And uh, there is a third pillar, which is very particular for our industry and for our company, and it has to do with uh, responsibility in consuming alcohol, because we are uh, not just in the beverage business, we're in the alcoholic beverage business. And although beer is a low alcohol content beverage, it's still an alcoholic drink. So we have in our purpose as an organization to promote more than anything responsible consumption of alcohol, either by providing options to the public of non-alcoholic beers at a wider scale uh, at every year in terms of uh, their uh, availability and awareness and everything, uh, but also in initiatives that have to uh, co connect, or I would say better, disconnect uh, driving and drinking uh, and uh, making sure that everybody is enjoying our products always in a way that is uh, responsible and not uh, excessive. Uh, we have several projects in each pillar and uh, I don't want to take now the time to go through each one of them. I can say only about one at this point, and maybe we can talk about these things uh, later. When talking about the environment, as I said, we have a lot of focus on uh, two things. One is uh, uh, being net zero in carbon emissions until uh, 2030 in, uh, in our production uh, facilities in Greece and in Europe and in the world. And the other is to address the scarcity of water. First of all, from our side, uh, diminishing the, the water that we use in our premises, in our production process, but also making sure that our partners, and in this case, uh, the farmers, are using as less water as possible and managing their water resources in the, in the best possible way. Uh, so we have several projects on that. Maybe I'll have the possibility to address them in more detail later. Great, thank you very much. We'll move on to Mr. Apostolopoulos uh, of Friesland Campina. Uh, give us a short introduction of yourself and tell us what Friesland Campina does um, as far as sustainability is concerned. We know that you have a best practice um, plant in Patra. You can tell us about that. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, um, happy birthday to all of you. And. Um, I'm the Total Quality Food Safety and the Dairy Affairs Manager of Fisland Campineras and also a President of the Greek uh, uh, Dairy Federation. Uh, my hat today, and I'm proud for this, is the Fisland Campina one. And uh, this is only not because of the principles that we have acquired uh, from the corporate, but because Fisland Campina, alas, has its own. It is, has a history of uh, 94 years in this uh, uh, state in this country that uh, if you make a kind of uh, judgment that you will see that uh, they consider our company as a Greek company because we have entered the homes, their hearts th through our products. And this is a very heavy 
in her, uh, heritage, I would say, to carry, and we feel proud to continue to do so. Uh, regarding um, now the type of uh, uh, initiatives that we have, uh, the, we have also pillars, uh, let's say, and uh, our first one is the, we have a, a, a saying, a motto, uh, like, let's say, that our purpose is to nourish our growing uh, uh, population of this earth without damaging the planet. This is our main uh, uh, purpose. And the first thing is to nourish our uh, population. And we have to nourish with the better quality products. And uh, not only that, but also giving the best in nutrients possible. You know that in our society, uh, the nutrition and health is very well tolerated, and <clears throat> many things uh, derive from this. I have to tell you just as an example that I won't use Netherlands, I will use uh, Germany, that uh, they consume 40 kilograms of sugar per year, per head, and three and a half kilograms of salt. And the WHO says you, have, you shouldn't consume more than nine kilograms of sugar per um, head and more than 1.56 kilograms per head. Uh, Netherlands is 28, I have to tell you, uh, for sugar. <laughs> um, so our, one of our purposes is to produce products that are really good for health. And for this, we have placed a rule. Uh, there is an EU rule which is called EU Pledge, which has a kind of uh, uh, parameters for the products that we use, we produce in terms of uh, sugar, uh, fat, uh, uh, saturated fat, uh, salt, and calories. And uh, we, of course, fulfill the, all our products under this uh, rule, and we have also developed a new one, uh, which we call it GNS, Global Nutritional Standard, which is even stricter for that, for this. And in our company, we have uh, an 85% of our products produced under this rule. And in Friesen Campina, alas, we, pr we have 95% of our products fulfilling this rule of uh, nutritional products. So we believe that we contribute to this uh, point. The other point is, the, uh, of course, the sustainability part, the, the, our uh, fingerprint, our footprint in terms of, the, or of what we do. And everybody believes that, uh, and rightly so, that uh, um, we are producing a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in order to produce our products, but this is not exactly true if you uh, express this not per, per kilogram of product used, but per nutrient used. For instance, milk is a quite friendly produced product if you express per protein instead of the plant-based ones. So we place a, a lot of effort in order to reduce that. And in our factory here in Patras, we have reduced energy, cons energy consumption by 48% uh, by using not only the waste, but also the uh, better use of the energy and also using solar panels uh, as well. We have also reduced significantly uh, water consumption, and this is a, an ongoing process, I would say. We have done a lot of uh, steps, but we still feel that there is a lot of room for improvement. And, uh, of course, this we don't keep it only to ourselves. We try to pass it on to our suppliers, to our customers, in order to follow our steps and uh, uh, really show them that uh, this is the only way forward. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Stengos, uh, Cyclify not only operates in a sustainable way, but supports other businesses to do so as well. Can you tell us a bit more about that and introduce yourself as well? Sure. First of all, uh, happy birthday. I'm glad because uh, 
I was incubated on Nola's Grove uh, back in uh, 2016. So I feel like a family here as a member. And it was uh, really important for us because um, we, we assume that uh, we can change the, the way we, we manage the waste and uh, how we, we throw away our waste and uh, it's possible to, to divert 100% of waste from uh, landfilling, which is a, a, the main practice, uh, unfortunately, here in Greece. And um, hopefully we, we found Orange Grove, uh, which uh, was a great starting point for us uh, since, uh, you know, the, the, the Dutch background uh, helped us to forget a bit that uh, we're in the Balkan uh, Peninsula. So we, we can uh, start um, working uh, on, on the direction of uh, more European uh, goals, let's say, and uh, this is something that is, uh, it might be achievable. Uh, so what we do, um, uh, we're a startup, of course, we don't have the size uh, of um, um, the two gentlemen here. Um, we focus on uh, developing um, uh, new technologies in order to, to track the, um, the material flows, let's say. Uh, for us, it's material, it's, it's not uh, waste. Uh, so we start from that point. Uh, so the first idea was like, uh, let's start um, a map and track uh, all the flows uh, from consumption point after uh, you buy a Heineken bottle uh, and you drink it and you feel great. Then uh, this bottle uh, as a... Um, as a deposit, let's say, as a, as a packaging, uh, uh, it's gonna end up somewhere, and uh, this somewhere uh, needs not to be the, the landfill. Uh, so we start uh, by developing these technologies. Um, we had a pilot uh, during our presence in Orange Grove, and with the support of Orange Grove, uh, the first uh, pilot, deploying a pilot in uh, a municipality. Great experience. Uh, in Varibula Bliagmeni, we mark um, uh, refusal bags. Uh, we um, we assign the, this marking, let's say, with uh, the designated owner of the bag, in order to, to be able to to find the bag, uh, scan the bag, the ID, let's say, on the bag, and um, recognize the, the owner of the bag, and uh, then uh, uh, promote uh, with um, uh, coins, let's say, virtual coins, of course. Uh, but um, we. We've been in this uh, waste management, let's say, sector um, uh, since uh, 2016. We realize uh, the lack of, um, of technology there, uh, because that's a problem for us. Technology uh, can be an enabler uh, in order to, to solve, um, uh, f for us, easy problems. But uh, unfortunately, um, based on uh, the metrics and the, the results, uh, there, there is still a problem there on how we manage our waste. Uh, so, uh, start, starting from uh, this pilot, the first technology, uh, we develop more technologies, let's say, in collaboration with uh, universities mainly. Uh, we participate in, um, in research projects, uh, funded uh, meaning from um, um, the, the Greek uh, Secretary of, um, of uh, Innovation, uh, four of them in total. Um, we since uh, 2016, uh, we filled uh, and granted uh, two patents, uh, all of them uh, on uh, waste management and uh, smart uh, measuring of, uh, of waste and, uh, and tracking. Now we are uh, in the process to fill two more. And um, mainly what we do, uh, we collaborate, uh, we act presently uh, as an innovation lab. Uh, we have some requests from industry, we gain uh, let's say, our credibility as a provider of uh, a, a functional, which is important, technologies on, on this sector. So we, we get some requests. Uh, we're trying to, um, to analyze, uh, let's say, the, the problem, and we start developing solution in-house. We don't go out of the shelf. So we, we're trying to play with uh, new solutions. Uh, we try to think out of the box. And we, we deliver these solutions to, to clients, which is not just municipality anymore. We also serve uh, more than 10 municipalities, uh, but we also have some uh, clients from uh, uh, the industry, uh, mainly in, in waste management. Uh, we start uh, installing IoT devices in, uh, in uh, different facilities. We, we track uh, vehicles and uh, we try to optimize the whole um, uh, process, let's say, in operation in order to, to reach the goal of 100% diversion from uh, landfilling. 
Uh, this is mainly what we do, let's say, waste management. For us, uh, every solution uh, needs to be, let's say, uh, in a sustainable way. Uh, so m w even uh, the, um, the devices we develop, uh, we try to, um, to have um, a low battery consumption or uh, low energy consumption for us uh, in order to, um, to, ha to have a practical uh, 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 meaning, let's say, on, uh, on what we deliver. And uh, everything is measured uh, uh, with uh, our KPIs, which is uh, how much waste in each stream uh, would divert. So um, all these, uh, we, uh, we have equals for, uh, for that, for our operation, let's say, on how much uh, CO2 um, we, we help, let's say, to, to reduce, to remove from from environment based on the, um, establishing our solution. So. This is mainly what we do. Uh, we're trying to collaborate. Uh, we start that uh, from the first day uh, uh, on Orange Grove to, to reach out to uh, big corporations in order to, to figure out the needs because at the end of the day, uh, you have to build something and uh, somewhere, somewhere else out there needs to, to use it. Otherwise, uh, you can play in your room. Uh, so uh, we reach out big corporations. We try to, to go out in the field. We test and test and... Uh, uh, and now we we are um, h happily. Uh, uh, I mean, we feel uh, great that uh, this is uh, rolling out, and uh, we're still uh, developing. We're, we are still creative, which is the most important. Great, and this is a great example of how um, technology plays such an integral part in in this. And I'm sure in the other two examples also. Um, Technology has been such an enabler in order to be able to come, to become more sustainable and to implement all these very interesting uh, projects. Uh, Mr. Kuvelis, we haven't forgotten you. <laughs> um, I think that I didn't think you did. I didn't think you did. As I'm hanging over your heads there, it's a bit spooky. But <laughs> um, look, what I'd like to to add to the very interesting cases that was uh, that were mentioned by all the three speakers. Um, I do not run a business, so I cannot speak about best practices and examples of what I run, but uh, with my, my involvement and experience, I've seen quite a lot of interesting things. And one thing I would like to share with you is when we talk about best practices in business, um, I need to make like this, this uh, differentiation between good examples or uh, good demonstration, let's say, cases that are good for marketing. Uh, but in the case of making a shift to a real sustainable operation, the thing is that a company needs to look into things that can be taken up, addressed, not only to show them, but to make things better, to solve issues that exist. I, I will come to an example that I have been um, actually teaching in some trainings that we did on ESG and sustainability over the past years at the time that I had not ever met Mr. Apostolopoulos or did not have any contact with Campina at the time. Uh, but it's a very interesting example because back in 2020, if I remember, yes, 2020, Frisland Campina issued a 300 million uh, bond or, or uh, permanent loan, if you like. Um, and at that time, uh, the company was actually implementing a policy that had to deal with issues related to human rights. Uh, and human rights because it was felt by the global community that agriculture had some issues regarding uh, employment rights, in some cases also child labor and so on. So Frisland Campina was very uh, open about it and said that we will establish key performance indicators and policies that will go downstream and influence the way that our suppliers, that our partners work and so on. The result of having this is not that it had, in a magic way, solved every problem in just one year, because this is a long process, as you can imagine. But the fact that the company was focusing on an issue that was considered important and was taking steps to make it better and not hiding it under the carpet was so important that at the time that this fund, this bond was raised, uh, the rating agency Fitch actually rated this uh, effort by the company um, to the indicator of three out of five. The indicator that, that uh, Fitch is doing is that uh, one is when you do a process and your impact is very positive, three is where it is neutral, and five it is when it is negative. 
Now, the three that uh, the, the company took at the time in 2020, and I think that it has become better, so it's probably two or even one now, meant that it did not have any extra burden on the uh, interest of, of uh, borrowing money from the global market for, for this uh, effort for raising this capital. Uh, in contrast to this, we had, and we often present this as a contrary example, of uh, an automaker, auto, automotive maker in, in Europe, I will not mention names for obvious reasons, that had actually made an effort to hide things under the carpet. And at the same time, the rating that they got from Fitch was the five. The five compared to the three that Frist and Campina got was that that company had to pay an extra uh, burden of close to 1% for the borrowing of money that it came to do in the market. So you see that uh, good practices and best practices begin at finding ways to solve the problems, be open and honest about it, and explain to the stakeholders, to communities, to investors, to everyone what the steps will be, rather than just going out there and say, look how good I am because I did this one or two things. So. Um, Getting more sustainable in terms of either sustainability that, con that concerns the environment or society or uh, even governance is very important and it is a continuous effort. It's not a thing that happens, you know, in a flash. It's not a thing that happens in uh, explaining something in terms of, of uh, marketing, but it is like a continuous effort. And um, as, as an American um, architect said, sustainability takes forever. And this is exactly the point. Thank you very much. Uh, and this also touches upon the next question uh, we had as far as um, sustainability kind of being um, uh, thought of as a marketing, um, as part of our marketing, as part of our CSR um, kind of policy in, in companies. And um, how However, um, in order to have actual impact, it needs to be actually embedded in the DNA of each company and of each um, business. And um, Mr. Kuvelis started saying a bit about this, but um, it is important to understand that at the end of the day, this is the, this, it's a win-win um, scenario if it's actually embedded in the DNA of, um, of the companies. And... Um, Mr. Guvelis, maybe you can tell us a bit of what your role is in, in this and how you, you support this, this effort. And then uh, we can move on um, to, to Psyche okay. Fi to give uh, us so a look, perspective of this. I have, I have been making an effort over the last, I would say, five years to make uh, understood towards every side, especially in companies that we work with, to try to make this shift to a proper sustainable uh, operation. Uh, we did this, I did this in my personal capacity as uh, an associate of the University of Cambridge. I did this through uh, Verimpact, which is a startup company that we started with some partners to try to help companies make this transition in this region where I am now in the Gulf, in many other places in the world. Um, and what we started off in every case was to explain that when we say CSR and ESG, we don't mean the same thing. Because CSR is, in a general way, giving back to society, which is great, actually. That's a very good thing, and it's good for companies to take initiatives that give back to society. But ESG is a very different thing. Because it is where sustainability, as you very correctly said, is connected to the DNA of the company, or if I put it in a more practical term, is connected to the core business of the company. So let me give you an example. If you have a company that is producing, for example, I don't know, metal furniture, uh, if you go and plant trees or clean up a beach, this is very good. It's very good giving back to society and cleaning up the environment and everything or planting forests, uh, but it's not connected to your core business, which is producing metal, metal uh, furniture. If, however, you connect the sustainability part to the way that you use paint so that the materials that you use are not... Uh, polluting the environment, or in the way that you source the uh, steel that you use or the materials that you use for your production in a way that do not increase CO2 emissions, then you start connecting what you do to your core business. And why this is important? Because ESG now is seen by everyone as a way to um, 
to connect what we would call the non-financial risks. So, for example, what I mentioned before, uh, the risk of human rights that, that uh, for instance, Campina wanted to make better and it did in the way it operated. This is non, not a financial risk per se, but it could have turned into a financial risk if uh, it had to pay a higher premium for, for, for um, borrowing money. So those non-financial risks are measured in terms of ESG. And so this is why companies need to report on these things, whether they are environmental or social or governance issues. And there's a whole big set of them. Uh, there are things that are related to CO2 emissions. There are things that are related to energy, uh, used to energy uh, intensity of how you, you do your operation, water use and so on. In terms of sustainable uh, social issues, it has to do with uh, employment practices, with training in the workplace with um, giving time and, and space for, for uh, workers to have a proper relationship with their families, like maternity or paternity rights and so on. Um, and when a company gets into those, there are a number of, of, of steps that it takes because you always start from what Paul Polman, another famous um, uh, guru of sustainability and also uh, from Unilever, a Dutch company, uh, had started pontificating many years ago that you have the low-hanging fruits, so I reduce my energy consumption, so I become better in terms of sustainability, but also save a lot of money. And from that point onwards, you go to the next level, which is that I become better because I reduce my non-financial risks. And I report on all of these things through my ESG performance. CSR is very good, but has nothing to do with everything I, I explained before. CSR is just good practices, good good things that you do to give back to society, but not connected to your core business. So you see, it's very different, and one has to explain this, help companies understand how you can make the transition, set up the whole measurement tools, the ways that you can collect data, the ways that you can report on them, and make sure that you use them to become a better company. Mr. Kuvelis, I think you're answering my questions before I even ask them. <laughs> um, so basically, the, the next question would actually be: Is does it does a company necessarily have to be in an industry that is considered um, in in the sustainability industry or in a heavy industry that needs to take steps towards sustainability in order to do to take steps towards towards this? However, from what you told us, is that any company, whether it's a very small business or a big industry or a big factory, we can all, all businesses can take these small steps towards being more sustainable, towards being more impactful. And this is something that is very um, useful to be embedded in, in the mission and in the company's DNA from the very start. And this is a very good example of what Cyclify has done as well also supporting um, other small businesses to become more sustainable and to have to incorporate this in, in the way they operate. Um, so moving on to my next question, um, the topic is, um, you mentioned it briefly before, uh, inclusivity and gender equality in the workplace. Um, how does this relate to sustainability? They have been, um, it, is, it is known that it does have a direct correlation to sustainability. So maybe um, Mr. Kuvelis can answer us the question of what is the correlation between this and sustainability. And then I would really like to hear from the two large corporations here as to what steps your companies are taking towards this and if you've seen any change in your corporations. <laughs> Uh, ever since you started uh, taking these steps. So should I go first or? Yeah, but I, I will need you to be uh, a bit brief because we've got another. I will be brief, I will be brief. <laughs> first of all, just one comment on what you said about small companies and smaller companies. Um, ESG is not about only big companies, it's about everyone because it is a matter of life or death. I mean, it's becoming a matter of life or death if you want to raise money, if you want to raise uh, loans and so on, but also it has to do with the image and the brand of your company. And a smaller company can adapt much faster than a big one. So it's, a, it's an opportunity not to miss. Now, for uh, DEI, for diversity, equity and integration, um, it is hugely important because it is one of the most 
of the strongest driving, let's say, issues related to social sustainability. And there are three things that I want to say about DEI. One is that it should be fully understood and respected and, and up, uh, taken up by the company as a principle. Uh, humans are not different because they come from a different race or different sexual um, uh, guidance or different uh, geographical uh, thing, uh, race, or what, uh, race or whatever. Uh, humans are humans. And people, uh, companies, need to treat them as, as people that are on the same rate. Now, in order to do this, there are some practical things that need to be taken into account. One of them is that it is very important to provide a safe environment, working environment for everyone. Not only safe in terms of working accidents, but safe in terms of, uh, you know, not feeling secluded, not feeling isolated, and so on. And the second step to doing this is that this safe environment needs to provide to working people what we call uh, appropriate grievance procedures. So if somebody feels, he or she, feels that they're not being treated uh, fairly or correctly because of, um, of discrimination, then they need to have a way to uh, go to a grievance process where they can report what is happening to them and at the same time being protected in terms of their identity, which is very important. And the third point that I want to make about TI is that once you take the step of really trying to make a company uh, embed this in the way it works, you have to report on that. And reporting on that is not a report you will write once a year. You have to collect information on the grievance cases that I mentioned, for example, at a very, um, very, very uh, condensed rate. So. Practically, you have to collect information every week or every month and report on this in quarters and so on because it addresses human behavior and human behavior will not wait for a year. You need to monitor this at a very close rate. So this is all I want to say about DEI and how important it is, but I'll be happy to contribute to the discussion. Perfect. Um, so we will move on. Hey, can you tell us a bit about what has been done at Friesland Campina? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I will be brief. Uh, I will start again with the, 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 the feeling of the people of being in a safe environment. This is the utmost important. And this is what in Frisdan Campina we gave a lot of attention. It is not by chance that uh, in our factory in Patras we have the highest non-accident <coughs> period of uh, uh, 10 years. And when we say non-accident, I mean not even an accident that keeps uh, someone away even for one day. So this is a record, I would say, that we have achieved and a feeling of the people that they live in an environment that they care for lives. And also, we have also uh, uh, a rule of inclusivity in our company. We accommodate racial, center, uh, all uh, uh, religion, all types of philosophies and uh, types of people in our company. And this is not uh, in theory. Uh, for instance, in our senior management positions, we have 38% women. And uh, this is going up and up every year. Uh, and this is not only by chance. It's also uh, uh, supported by scientific uh, um, literature which says that an inclusive company produces better revenue and they have in uh, uh, Harvard Business School they have uh, actually measured that and they measured it by 41 percent the more inclusive company they have 41 percent bet better revenue than the others that they are not so it is not only uh, human but it's also a corporate interest for us to do so. Thank you. Uh, I have very few things to add to what uh, Mr. Kouvelis and Mr. Apostolopoulos said. Uh, indeed, very few, so because uh, I agree with both the principles and the application of the principles in uh, real business life. Just two things, though, about diversity. What is tremendously important and what we do in Athena Brewer in Heineken is to find the imbalances and try to balance them, addressing them directly. It's setting KPIs in these kind of things, key performance indicators, up to the level that you reach the point that you don't even need 
to set or even discuss about setting KPIs, uh, being uh, truly diverse in the sense that we now have uh, as a male-oriented industry, as I said before, uh, that was the history of beer in, in Greece and in most of the European countries. We have 25% of our management team uh, female, the obvious in balance, this we aim to balance in senior positions to improve year by year, starting from a low level to, to improve with specific, again, targets, objectives, and plans to, to, to achieve them. And for the obvious reasons that you, uh, that you mentioned. Second thing, when it comes up to inclusion, it's a little bit more difficult to set the KPI there because you need to nurture this environment that uh, fosters uh, the ability of people to, the possibility of people to speak openly and uh, make sure that what they say is not only heard, but also there is some action on that, that they are taken. Uh, and there you have, again, the people that play the role. It's the role of the management, and this is what we do in Athena Brewery, to ensure that this happens and to make sure that the messages are not uh, do not disappear either top down or bottom up. You have to make sure that you spend time, you devote time, which is the most important resource we have now, more than money, is time. This is what we're lacking, this is what we're running behind. To devote, to ensure that you have enough time to listen and to collaborate with people and also enough time to respond to them <laughs> even negatively when this is uh, it's not possible to, to go along with some proposals. So this is what I just wanted to, to add, and what we also do and measure internally in Athena Brewery. Thank you very much. So um, from what I understand is educating and training people in management positions in order to be able to, um, to implement these changes in in these companies is also very important, which takes me to the next subject. We've got three minutes, but I will dare. <laughs> um, is the role of the people who support businesses and educate businesses as far as social impact and sustainability is concerned, um, such as Orange Grove, which has played a very integral role um, in supporting all the businesses that have been through the incubator um, and also supported them to embed all these concepts into the, from the beginning of their business into the business DNA and into the operations. Um, so as far as information and education is concerned, um, what do you feel, how can these organizations support businesses from their beginning in order to become um, more impactful, in order to become more sustainable, and how can they support them towards this direction? I will give the floor to you, Mrs. Stengel, since you've been through the process relatively recently and you're still um, a startup as well, and then maybe Mr. Kuvelis can close as, as from the aspect of the educator as well. Okay, great. Um, of course, again, we don't have the same size. Uh, so, um, to start with, um, you incubated in, uh, in a place like Orlands Grove as a startup. Uh, so, for us and uh, for, uh, for our experience, let's say, uh, what we do is uh, to develop solutions that at the end of the day, they're going to help um, bigger corporations, let's say, to, to to to, um, to to proceed in a in a meaningful change and uh, measurable uh, with measurable metrics. So um, for us, okay, we have um, uh, let's say an expertise on on the waste management uh, solutions and and uh, developing uh, uh, those technologies, let's say, in this area. But um, what we realize is that uh, each entity uh, has um, three main characteristics, like let's say we, they consume energy, they, they consume water, they generate waste. This is the uh, same for each entity. 
So we just uh, took the one, the first uh, part, and we try to, to develop solutions in that direction that, that uh, they're going to be helpful for everyone. Uh, but uh, there are more and more solutions coming up that um, they're going to really help uh, corporations in that direction to, to, to optimize, let's say, the resources and uh, at the end of the day help the environment. Uh, and this is the part we can, uh, we can uh, offer to bigger corporations. Um, and of course, we agree with uh, all the equ equality and the, the government, the, the governance and, and the social part. But uh, there is an impact also in the, in the environment. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kuvelis, can you... Um... Uh, yes, on the, on the uh, training and knowledge building, I think that organizations like the Orange Grove, uh, and by the way, my congratulations and happy birthday for the 10 years of making a difference, really, in Greece. I think that um, organizations that provide knowledge and provide <laughs> training and support can make a huge difference. Because um, when you try to educate companies, either small ones or uh, small and medium companies or bigger ones, uh, um, there are some things that make a big difference. One is that training and understanding and learning all this that it takes to really make a shift to sustainability is not a thing that will happen one-off. It's not like we did the seminar, we tick off the box and ends. It is an ongoing process. You have to come back, discuss, empower, and so on. The second thing that we see through the training seminars that we have done over the last uh, at least five years is that when we engage with people and we bring them in, we realize, and more importantly, they realize that they know more than they think they know about this whole issue. It's, you know, it's a thing out there, ESG, and when you involve them in, they say, ah, okay, we understand how this works, we can be part of that, and we want to be part of that. Very important. And that leads to my third point, which is that everyone needs to be involved. We have a process in which, uh, in like a total quality, let's say, process that we do, we want to involve everyone from the leadership, which is very important. Leadership needs to have both the process, needs to, to, to support it in full political support and how it goes. But it goes down to the very last working person in a company because they all have a way to contribute and they all have a way to be part of that and to feel proud about that as well, to be part of the, the whole process. And that's why I was very happy to hear both companies that are represented here, Athenian Brewery and Fresno Campina, that they do involve their people in what they are doing. Um, because sustainability will not happen if anybody does not take part of this process. And I think that through training and continuous involvement, this can happen. Perfect. That was a very nice closing to um, all the arguments here into our conversation. Do we have time for questions? Perfect. Okay, so if anybody has any questions for any of the gentlemen here. Yeah, so my name is Vasilis uh, Kijakopoulos. I'm a plan manager of the uh, Papa's plan. I'm not going to ask. My question is that, uh, as Mr. Kuhlman said, the low hanging fruits are uh, already uh, covered uh, regarding sustainability. Um, so if, in order to go further, we need uh, uh, extra, extra investments. So who is going to pay for these extra investments? I can say something about that, that in principle, when it comes to, to large corporations, the way to safeguard that you have uh, the investment the resources to pay for the extra investments is to make sure that the commitments that are coming, uh, you are very, how say, very transparent about your commitments and you are very vocal and very public about your commitments, if you allow me. The more public you get and the more vocal you get and the more transparent you get when it comes to your commitments, the less possible is to start cutting down on the investment necessary to achieve those commitments. And the fact that the whole uh, world is moving towards a, I don't know, a consolidated financial and non-financial reporting, which includes uh, sustainability and responsibility, ESG principles, that you cannot get financing, <coughs> even basic financing, if you don't tick the boxes when it comes to, to ESG, this also uh, is a factor that safeguards the appropriate funds. And I can tell you for a fact, at least from what I know from our company, that the only investment that is not under the microscope every year for our 
ongoing investment plan, and this represents more than 60% of our overall investment plan in, uh, in Heineken, of Heineken in Greece, is the ones that are related to our commitments when it comes to cutting down on CO2 emissions, to uh, cutting down on water consumption, to bringing forward social responsibility programs connected to our business and to the communities uh, around us. These are the only ones that are not subject to discussion whether they are important or not because of those commitments. And as Mr. Gouvelis also mentioned earlier, that new financing doors also open to you if you want to move towards this direction. It's not even this. It's can I, can I, the, I, the old financing doors don't, uh, don't, don't exist anymore. You don't have access to, to the financing tools that exist if you don't, uh, as I said, tick the boxes when it comes to, to ESG. Can I just make a note, because I found this question very interesting. Uh, it was very interestingly phrased because the gentleman who asked it, I, sorry, I could not hear the name, uh, referred to investments and not expenditure, not, not spending. And that is why the question is very pertinent, because sustainability is an investment. And as an investment, it needs to be financed and paid by those that pay for every investment. If you replace the word sustainability with, say, technology, who would pay for the investment in technology for a company that does not want to be left behind? It's exactly the same. Sustainability needs to be invested in because, as again Paul Polman was saying 20 years ago, unless we invest in that, in the future we don't exist. And so it has to do with existing, it has to do with being able to get uh, loans, to get funding from banks, from international organizations and so on. But it also has to do with the brand of the company. So you're investing in all of these things. And uh, that's why I, I just wanted to make the comment that I think that the question actually contributes a lot to our discussion because it is an investment and not an expenditure. Thank you, Mr. Kouvelis, for the um, explanation and clarification. Um, uh, what, I'm, what I was looking for uh, with this question is, are consumers or customers or society, are they prepared for extra um, this extra investment. So I, I feel that after all these years, I work in, 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 in industry, 30 years in industry, uh, we, we implemented um, uh, hundreds of best practices in sustainability. Still, I have to convince um, uh, consumers that uh, they have to pay a little bit more about uh, the products they are uh, buying. If Yes, you have a very good point. Not all consumers and not all buyers will appreciate the value, the uh, value that you have embedded in your product or your process, which is the same as buying anything. Some consumers will have, have the margin or the elasticity to buy a better product than another, but I think that it is to the benefit of both society and your company to actually get better in producing better things through better practices. Um, History shows that eventually uh, society goes towards those better products. Uh, there will always be, you know, the cheaper products, but, you know, if you had to buy something for your family and you had to choose between something that is produced by European standards for health, safety and everything, or something coming from the depths of Asia that doesn't produce any of those benefits, uh, I'm quite sure that you would go for the first rather than the last one. So, you know, this is the way that we, we go for it. But, yeah, I mean, it is a very valid question that you're asking. May I add something? Uh, if... yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Please go on. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's like a family here. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add that uh, we indeed live in a society that uh, we value the important things, not through commu normal communication or through education, but only when they come as a disaster. And this is not concern only the sustainability, it's also the health, it's also peace, the very important parts that we do have and we don't value. And this is an investment that does not have a, an immediate return on the product. It has a long uh, return, like our products in our Greek market. They are believed to be the most nutritious ones and the most safe one. But this was not built in one day 
with just one investment. It is built through a continuous uh, rule and communication and uh, belief and uh, sensitivity that the consumers really takes it gradually. Thanks. Mr. Stengas? Yeah, I, was, uh, I just need to add something regarding the financing of, uh, of the incremental, let's say, cost of uh, sustainability. Um, recently, uh, we were trying to, to figure out ways to, to finance another project. Um, and uh, we realized uh, after we prepared, um, let's say, our application uh, on how many carbon credits um, we generate we, uh, from a project, let's say, on uh, waste uh, management, so in, in terms of CO2 removal. And um, we, we use the VERA, um, let's say, uh, verification, the, the, this is accreditation, let's say, of, uh, of VERA. And we realized that from Greece, there was zero project submissions uh, in terms of um, waste management. I, I, I'm not sure about uh, energy or water consumption, but measurable uh, carbon credits in terms of waste. There is no project submitted from Greece. So that means that um, perhaps in your plant in Patras, uh, you have something measured already. Uh, and perhaps this is, uh, can be correlated, uh, let's say, with, uh, with CO2 um, uh, carbon credits. Uh, and perhaps you can uh, submit it and use it and sell this carbon credit, which is, uh, at the time in the market, is uh, 80 euros uh, uh, per credit. So um, there are uh, multiple options, and we need to f um, look around before we end up to the consumer again, which is the obvious uh, solution. That's all. Thank you. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Should we move I, on to I the next we, question? I, regarding the consumers um, fitting the bill for these changes, uh, I think we have to have a very brave conversation as well as far as profit margins um, and what role that plays in this as far as we're at high inflation, we're at high profits in the market, and who can afford to take this on. I think it's a conversation that should be looked at. And also, it's important to mention that all these investments do turn into a benefit for the business itself in the future. So, yeah. Um, should we move on to the next? Do, do you have anything to add on this? Should we move on to the next question? Elenis uh, Konra, I spoke earlier, so I won't say who I am again. Um, it's a very practical question, actually, because we are talking about Orange Grove startups. So what I would like, and I think the question is for Mr. Kuvelis, but whoever else uh, of the panel would like to answer, I would be delighted. When in a startup life, uh, in a startup's life, is the best way to start becoming aware of the benefit of investing in sustainability and what is the best way to go about it and who should educate them? That's three questions in one, but they're very connected. I'm joking. Um, that's a very good question, actually. And the answer is that uh, the time to embed sustainability in a startup is even before you start it. When you start developing the concept of what your company will be doing, that's exactly the time when you need to build sustainability in it connected to. I have been teaching recently to the University of Cambridge a set of uh, 10 or 15 young startups from mostly Africa and some from, from Southeast Asia, where I was trying to explain to them how they need to take the work that they do and connect it to the sustainable development goals. And they found it very interesting because they themselves started telling me that this is something that we will build in our business plan and also in our narrative when we go towards investors and tell them that, look, you will not only be investing in us because we're doing a good product or a good technology or something, but because we're giving back also in, to society by contributing to reaching the sustainable development goals. So this is actually a very strong argument for a startup to show that it has embedded sustainability in the way it goes. And this is why it needs to be built in since day one or day zero, if you like, about it. I hope I'm answering your question. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so, we'll, it's a very interesting conversation. I think we could continue all day, but we have to stop now.
to uh, welcome the next panel. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your interesting questions.